Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Studies at Charles Darwin University, and welcome to Outrider 44. Why do I need to network? And this has been the end of our rather fascinating and also a little bit naughty trilogy, where we've explored mentoring, coaching, and of course, yes, we finish with the dreaded networking. The word networking is being used as a band-aid to mask a series of problems in our universities and also wider institutions and organisations. So truly appalling leadership. <laughs> Understatement. Bullying, really complicated and problematic authorship cultures, but also dilemmate appointments, which is increasingly becoming a concern. So if an individual supposedly can just network, then we can all succeed. And that success through networking will occur regardless of the diabolical state that our universities are currently in. And of course LinkedIn is fueled by the promise of networking. If I can just network enough, then I'm going to get that postdoc that becomes the postdoc that becomes the postdoc that becomes the permadoc. Or I'm going to find a mate who's going to be able to get me a good job. Now, networking is based on a flawed premise, and that is an individual can intervene in the toxic, chaotic, and bullying environments around them and be successful. You might think that's true, that's okay, good energy to you. But you see, the consequence of that ideology is that if someone doesn't succeed, it means they haven't networked properly and say they can't get a job after a restructure. They've been restructured out of an organisation and they just can't really claw back into full-time work. Well, networking as an ideology suggests that they just haven't worked hard enough and intervened and created those options and opportunities. But is that true? Is that real? Is it appropriate? So today I am going to talk about networking, its strengths and its challenges, but also what I want to do, this is a positive outrider, I can, you know, I could go on for probably 15 days talking about the problems with networking. I'll talk through some of those challenges, but what I want to explore today is a much more positive series of options and questions that you can ask yourself so that you are able to be honest in yourself and your relationships with others. So we're going to take different iterations of networking and make it meaningful for you. Let's do this together. You see, networking has many paths, many tropes, many definitions, and many trajectories. Today, I want to work through the components that nest most effectively in the contemporary mess that is international higher education. So at its most basic, networking is an exchange of information between people. And those people often share something. It's an interest or an occupation or an organization. It is a way to expand the circle of your colleagues that you can learn about new job opportunities, but you can also learn about the changes in your profession or occupation. And you know, that's great stuff. Conferences and seminars in academic life are like the home of networking. And of course, the pandemic shifted many of these networking opportunities online. But the goal of networking is to enhance one's employment opportunities and to enhance one's knowledge of the field. All fine. Now, I know some of this seems a bit old-fashioned. I think that's the part of it that makes me sort of smile as I'm delivering this outrider. It all seems a bit mad men, doesn't it? You know, if we can just meet enough people and network, then that great job is going to appear for me. Now, looking at the state of international higher education, remember I research international higher education. I don't just talk about this stuff. I actually research what's going on. And... I think we can see the lie of that statement that if an individual just works hard, they're going to be successful in higher education. That's a lie. So let's drill down to some more precise and engaging definitions of networking that we can actually use. 
And one great phrase that I recommend to you is networks of practice. Networks of practice, derived from John Seely Brown and Paul DeGid. And of course, it comes from communities of practice. Great stuff. It refers to the social networks between individuals. And these networks are often informal or casual or accidental. And these networks of practice allow information to be exchanged between people. But the point of all of this is that it's got goals. There are goals to be achieved. And they're not about goals for people. They're about goals for ideas and the profession and the workplace. So you can see how this is very different, more subtle, instead of our cliches of networking. If, you know, and the cliches of networking, I think, are getting stupid, right? If I just go to enough conferences, spend all this money, go to enough conferences, have really bad coffee and share enough muffins, I'm going to get a job. Perhaps even more disturbingly, if I'm nice to this person, then they'll give me a job. Networks of practice are different. They're authentic, they're iterative, and they have a goal in mind. So do think about that particular model. Now, networks can be very strong or they can be very weak, but they focus on the organisation of ideas and information between people. Networks of practice are important because they enable individuals to improve their work in a context. So it's not about, oh, I'll meet this person and then I'll do this and I, I. It's actually, I am engaging with another human and we all improve our work together, a community of workers. Tremendous. Now, we've seen a lot of these strong ideas emerge through digitization and the disintermediation and deterritorialization that emerges through digitization. This mode of networking is much more aligned with scholarship and intellectual life and intellectual culture. The exchange of ideas, respecting knowledge, knowing that we are all merely servants of knowledge. Now, obviously, through the pandemic, networking changed, and that's why I'm only talking about it you know, some years later, because I've been watching what's occurred to the ideolo what has occurred to the ideology of networking. And what's happened since the pandemic is networking now is almost all online. And, and I get quite upset, so I've got to try and control my voice here, but it's also increasingly desperate. We see people online emailing us, doing sort of the direct messages on LinkedIn and so forth, increasingly desperate as people are restructured out of their organisations. And that's appalling enough. And a lot of those crew ha are yet to return to work. So they were restructured during the pandemic and they've never quite been able to hold on to full-time work again. And then, of course, and this is where I do get upset because these are a lot of my friends, the people who are left, so, you know, a third of the workforce... Half the workforce was sacked, was restructured out of the organisation, and the people that are left are doing the work of three people, five people, or in the case of one of my friends, eight people. Therefore, noting all these problems with networking, I want to finish our very odd little trilogy with a much more honest discussion between us about the very nature of connection. How can we transform networking as a cliche by focusing on the meanings that we give to connection in our present? Now, I've been deeply transformed by Robin Smith's 2023 book, Boundaries and Bridges, The Exponential Power of Connection. I feel so privileged to have lived long enough to have read this fine book. And Smith shows us that the great problem of digitization is that connection has been seen to be easy. You know, we like, we love, we retweet. So all of this is a bit straightforward, a bit fluid. But we're not asking the difficult questions of digitization and connection. In a digital age, what really does it mean to connect 
with another human? And perhaps even more importantly, how do we mark our boundaries? And that is the challenge, I think, of networking. There's all these conversations about building up networks, let's build the networks, and all of it's a bit yucky and a bit oversharing for my taste. Let me overshare, 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 no. Rarely is there a recognition of the consequences of oversharing. And that's why Smith has focused on boundaries and bridges. You can live your life through those tropes. Increasingly, I am. So that means we are connecting with meaning and with purpose, but yeah, we know when to disconnect. Networking forms relationships of leverage. What can this person do for me? That's often called a transactional relationship. Yuck. So when we start to think about boundaries and bridges, it asks us to pause and reflect and think about how we initiate and respond to communication events and communication acts. Why do we communicate? And do we make a decision to communicate with trust and authenticity and respect? The focus on networking is meant to be that all our lives become work and the boundaries between the working and professional lives and our personal lives become blurred and there are astonishing consequences for that. Everything becomes work. Therefore, and this is, this is my new thing that I'm sharing with you, this is my new thing, attention to solitude, attention to autonomy must be the point from which we commence our conversations and our communication. This is about you coming to a moment in time with authenticity and integrity rather than leveraging somebody for what they can do for you. This is about sitting with yourself and seeing if you like the person you're sitting with. When we have a sense of that personal and then professional value, we're able to build those bridges with clarity and therefore build those bridges with attention to cross-cultural communication. That we stop thinking that everybody is like us and everybody communicates like us. If we ask questions and we are honest and robust enough to listen to the answers, if we can remain curious about other people's lives and other people's choices, we can continue to build those very solid and important and powerful bridges. This is not transactional. This is meaningful. Devorah Zak, in the discussion of networking, asked that we focus on connections. But Zak used an incredibly powerful phrase, quote, do not compare my insides to other people's outsides, end of quote. I've been sitting in that statement since I first read it, and too often we assume that the public face that other people present to us is real, is true, is authentic. Now, Goffman's theorization for many decades post the presentation of self shows that a front stage is being constructed. We are not dealing with an authentic or real person. We are dealing with a front stage. Now I know when we're dealing with all these front stages around us, everybody's lives look so, <laughs> so much happier <laughs> and so much more successful and so much more enlivening and so much more exciting than anything we are doing. But of course what's happening is we're judging our insides from other people's outsides and we're found to be lacking. 
Now, Kurt Grayson and David Baldwin have shown that we need to actually really stop using the word networking, break it down. So we talk about connection, collaboration, and creation. I love this. So this means we can learn from others, not through their successes and their front stage and their hype and, oh, I'm so excited to talk about this. Look at me, I'm so successful. We stop supposedly learning from how to do that front stage. Oh, I'm so successful. I want to be just like you. I sort of am interested in stopping that behavior now. Just everybody stop. And we realize that we learn much more from other humans when we sit with them, when we walk with them, and we listen to them speaking of their vulnerabilities, their fears, their losses, and their failures. And I want to finish this series with an exercise from one of my dearest friends, which is probably profoundly appropriate today. Hello, Gwilym. Love you, Gwilym, very, very much. And Gwilym and I met each other in a very difficult point for both of us in our lives. And he was in Wales, he still lives in Wales. I live in Australia, don't know where I'll be shortly, but we live in Australia. So Wales, Australia, international. We need digitization. But he is a wise man. He is a kind man. He is a compassionate man. And I learn from Gwilym every single day. And Gwilym taught me, and this could change your life, it changed mine. Gwilym taught me about the 10, 7, 5 rule. 10, 7, 5. Your 10 defining moments, your 7 critical choices, and your 5 pivotal people. When we start to think about the building of the bridges and the formulation of the boundaries, there is some value, I think, in starting with Gwilym's diagnostic, 10, 7, 5. Defining moments, critical choices, pivotal people. Now, I conducted that exercise on myself I'm making a lot of very big changes and doing a lot of deep thinking at the moment. And when I conducted that exercise on myself, it was not only incredibly surprising, can I say, it was also remarkably moving. Gwilym's exercise will allow you to think about, okay, what are my boundaries? What's important in my space? And with authenticity, working out when you want to build that connection, and why. So all of this comes from configuring and constructing yourself as a full authentic person who can look in the mirror, be honest, recognize failures, recognize fear, recognize vulnerability and still stand up straight, take a breath and continue to walk through life. The relationships that you build from this strong sense of an authentic self will make you and will transform you. These bridges are important because they allow us to manage our expectations, our life expectations, come to every relationship with honesty and treat other people with respect rather than what they can do for us. Now, technology can be used well, it can be used badly to build these bridges, but the gift of digitization is that we can communicate with people around the world. And it can also allow the maintenance of relationships that started in real life, started in flesh and blood and bone. And this is incredibly important to me. You know, I've lived in four countries, I've worked in 10 universities, and I would not have the relationships that I have with these astonishing people I know around the world if it was not for digitization. And these deep relationships that I've made matter so much. 
these former colleagues, these great friends of mine are important, not because they can do any, anything for me, because they can't and I wouldn't ask them to anyway, but because in and of themselves, they are important. They are great people. I see them. I respect them. And most importantly, we shared a portion of our lives. We were a witness to a moment in our shared past. And we've carried that memory with us through the present. These people are the witnesses of our lives. Therefore, let's think about the meaningful bridges that we can build. And yes, build them for career advancement, if that's your thing, for learning and for skill development, which must be our thing, but advice and assistance, information and resources, and also the enabling of our professional reputations but also our personal integrity. The word networking just doesn't convey this level of complexity. So let's come to our professional and our personal identities, thinking about boundaries, thinking about bridges, thinking about authenticity, think about caring for the delicate relationships in our lives. Now, we, I know this is hard to do, right? Because we live in times of abusers and users. People judge us for what we can do for them. But is that the really, really the point of relationships? Is that really the point of a working life? And that's where, again, influencer culture lies to us. But as remote work increases, contract work increases, portfolio work increases. We have to learn to both create and sustain these important and authentic relationships. It is time that we stop treating people like a transaction, granting them value for what they can do for us rather than how we together can grow achieve, be authentic, be real, and value another human being for their breath. I wish you love, light, and peace. Tea out.